Thank you, Tira, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all here, and it's uh, fun to be here to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm going to cover a fair amount of ground. Uh, I'm glad to answer questions, but I guess most of them are usually at the end. But if I'm not making myself clear and you just can't wait, go ahead. Um, so uh, first of all, my disclosures. I have no relevant financial relationships. I do uh, disclose that I'm a real enthusiast about ge genetics, so I hope that that comes through to you. It's a wonderful field. If you're thinking about going into it, it underlies all of biology. Uh, it is basically a hunting license to do whatever you want in biomedicine. So uh, I urge you to think about that career if you're at that stage of your, your career. So I'm going to talk about some features of Mendelian disease and then review the rapidly evolving field of clinical DNA sequencing. And then I'm going to talk about dis uh, disease gene discovery uh, results and tools, and I'll focus particularly on the Baylor Hopkins Center for Mendelian Genomics, which is one of now four centers around the country that are charged with finding as uh, the genes responsible for as many Mendelian phenotypes as possible. <clears throat> so uh, we um, customarily think of Mendelian disease as being quite rare, and yet uh, it is becoming increasingly prominent. I see that this slide says this month. This is actually, I think, from January 2015, so I apologize for that error. But the point is, in any month, if you look at all four uh, issues of uh, the New England Journal, you will see a lot about Mendelian disease. In this particular month, there were, um, let me see here, you can see that there were, um, uh, can you hear me okay? You can see that, uh, you know, there were typical Mendelian disorders uh, with onset in childhood. Uh, but look at here, here's one that's uh, adult coronary artery disease. And um, if you looked in the editorial section, there was even an article about uh, ethical issues about uh, screening for genetic, uh, monogenic dis dis uh, genetic disease. So there's a lot of interest uh, about Mendelian disease um, throughout the biomedical community right now, and we have, uh, I'll talk a minute about why that might be so. Well, I'm going to talk right now about why that might be so. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, the Genome Project obviously provided a reference sequence, so that made uh, finding the uh, relevant disease genes uh, much easier. Um, the, obviously, the availability of uh, new sequencing technology that dramatically decreases cro cost and increases throughput also uh, gave us uh, a, a many new avenues for finding uh, genes responsible for Mendelian disease. And things like the HapMap project and the Thousand Genome project uh, gave us an appreciation of the extent of, quotes, normal human genetic variation, not only in North America and uh, Northern Europe, but uh, from populations around the world. So that turns out to be a tremendous resource. <clears throat> and lastly, there has been the development of genomic and genetic strategies to identify uh, responsible variants in genes. So um, the first thing you might say is, um, well, when should I think of a Mendelian disorder? If I'm a physician seeing a patient or I'm somewhere in the healthcare profession. Uh, for many Mendelian disorders, not all, but for many, the phenotype includes multiple systems that are not easily related one to another. Uh, many Mendelian disorders, but not all, have relat relatively early age at onset, often in the first decade of life. There are, of course, the recessive ones are, of course, increased with uh, consanguineous unions. And if you find multiple affected SIBs and or generations, then obviously that's a pretty key um, clue, and if you think about it, there's sort of an inescapable rules of biology about how genes are transmitted from one generation to the next, and we use those so-called Mendelian rules to really help us evaluate candidates for Mendelian disorders, and it's one sort of uh, fundamental bedrock of genetics that whatever you find pretty much has to be put in this context. So <clears throat> although we do think about uh, Mendelian disorders as having their onset in childhood, uh, I would submit uh, that there are many Mendelian disorders uh, that uh, present in adult age. Uh, 
and that our colleagues in internal medicine, I confess I'm a pediatrician, our colleagues in internal medicine uh, have to be more alert to the possibility of Mendelian disorders. So I just want to make that point uh, by presenting two families to you that we've seen in the last few years. So the first is a man who was 34 years old, and he presented to Johns Hopkins Hospital actually about uh, two and a half years ago. And he had a fever, 10-day history of pretty high fever, really bad pharyngitis. And he'd been treated by his uh, personal physician with antibio antibiotics, uh, actually two different antibiotics, still febrile. And so the physician, for reasons not known to me, uh, get, treated him with a large dose of steroids as well. Uh, following that intervention, uh, now 10 days into his illness, the man began to, or now eight days into his illness, uh, the man began to develop uh, confusion. And uh, that led to him being taken to a local emergency room where the doctors were smart enough to think about hyperammonemia and they measured his ammonia and it was 10 times normal, 280 micromolar. Uh, and he had a mild respiratory alkalosis, which uh, in the presence of hyperammonemia suggests a, a urea cycle disorder because uh, there's no accumulation of organic acids and ammonia is a, a, a stimulant for the central respiratory uh, centers. So he was rapidly transferred to the Johns Hopkins Hospital Medical Intensive Care Unit. By the time he arrived, two hours later, he was in uh, the early stages of coma and a CT scan showed uh, mild uh, cerebral edema, and his ammonia had already risen to 420 micromolar. For those of you that are not physicians, he had about uh, one foot and maybe three toes in the grave at this point. Um, so he, uh, the emergency room docs, uh, or the MICU docs did their thing. One of the things they did is they called uh, genetics, and so I happened to be the attending, and I went with one of our residents, Hans Bjornsson, uh, to see this man. So we saw him about 20 minutes after he hit the, the MICU. And um, so like any good geneticist, one of the first questions we asked was, uh, well, what is the family history? We asked this of a uh, fourth year medical student who was in involved in the case. And he said, uh, what is the, I think the most common response to that question, which is uh, negative. So I would submit uh, one important take-home less lesson from this uh, lecture is unless the person is adopted and knows nothing about their family, the family history is never negative. You may have some per pertinent negative results that help you eliminate certain things, but the family history always tells you information. But when you get the family history, you have to get it and think at the same time, and sometimes as you think, you'll come up with new questions. So you have to be willing to go back and forth with the family as new ideas, new hypotheses for the diagnosis uh, enter your mind. So uh, this is the information we got from the medical student. So I said, what do you mean negative? Go out and ask the family for more detail. The family was assembling in the MICU waiting room. So he went out and uh, he came back and it turned out the family was a little bit more extensive. And so there, here's the second version of the family history. So what you can see is that the proband, indicated by the red arrow, uh, had a brother who died, and he had two male uh, twins, identical twins, uh, or no, uh, fraternal twins, who also died. Now, it turns out the twins died uh, in childbirth um, and um, almost certainly had something else. The brother, the, the medical student, I said, what do you mean negative? And the brother, uh, the medical student said, well, not to worry. The brother uh, died of drowning when he was 14 years old. So what did I say? So I said, well, why did a 14-year-old boy drown? Go back out there and find out. So he went back out there. And um, the, uh, the story was that the 14-year-old brother was on an outward bound-like experience, and he developed a an upper respiratory illness and was sick, and then his campmates reported that he began to be confused. And by confused, they noted a time when he couldn't find his hiking boots and they were right in front of him. 
And uh, that night, the night before he died, they all went in, in, into their tents to go to bed. They were camped by a lakeside. And in the morning when they woke up, they found him floating off the end of the dock, drowned. So they theorized that he got up in the middle of the night in his confused state and walked out on the end of the dock and fell off and drowned. And we actually got the um, autopsy because he, because it was a, an acute death, he had to be autopsied in, out in West Virginia someplace. And um, the local uh, coroner said, you know, the strange thing about this drowning is, I mean, the, the boy cl clearly drowned, but he had cerebral edema. And that's a phenotype that you never see with uh, drowning because drowning takes place very quickly. Uh, I, to cut to the chase, we got a baby tooth of this boy, and he also had the same urea cycle disorder that his brother presented with. So it turns out that this is late onset ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Um, and um, the, uh, we've studied this molecularly, um, uh, one of our graduate students, and uh, Ted Hahn, and um, Ted found a promoter variant, uh, never before seen, in a four-base, uh, highly conserved element that's important for binding of a particular a new, uh, hepatic, a liver-specific uh, transcription factor. So we uh, theorized, and he, uh, Ted actually showed that it reduces the activity of OTC in, in reporter assays and so forth. So we theorized that this is a promoter mutation, regulatory mutation that reduced the function of OTC, uh, that the, both of these boys had enough OTC activity to get through uh, early years of their life, but under conditions of severe stress, this genetic vulnerability was brought out and uh, in both cases uh, led to their death. Now, of course, the geneticists in the room will say, well, it looks like the mother must be a carrier. She's had two affected sons. And uh, we tested her, and she was a carrier. And then we tested her sister, and she was also a carrier. And we wanted to test these two boys, each of whom is at a one and two risk of having this phenotype. Both of them are young adults. Both of them are underachieving in comparison to their family. This is a quite sophisticated family. And both of them refused. Uh, they live out in the Midwest, and they both refused to uh, be tested. So I don't know what they have, but I'm suspicious that they might have the same thing just based on their sort of performance. So here's a Mendelian disease lurking in uh, uh, an adult patient. The patient is just more vulnerable to particular, particularly severe environmental stress, namely this bad infection and uh, a dose of steroids perhaps contributing to it. Now in case you think that that's just a one-off example, uh, a, a few months later, uh, Hillary Vernon, one of my colleagues, uh, was asked to see this man, who is a 54-year-old man, who presented to the cardiology clinic with severe dilated cardiomyopathy. And they noticed that he seemed to have a, some features of early onset dementia. Uh, and the theory, going theory, was that perhaps because his uh, congestive heart failure was so bad that this may just be some uh, uh, low-level chronic uh, uh, CNS insult, but they were worried about his B12 status, and they sent uh, a, a homocysteine level and a methylmalonic acid level, and both of them were elevated. And it turns out that this man has a cobalamin C uh, form of combined uh, methylmalonic acidemia and homocystinuria. He died of his, shortly thereafter, he died of his um, uh, uh, cardiac, his congestive heart failure. Uh, but it turns out his sister also has this phenotype. She's also middle age. She's also intellectually not doing as well as you might expect for the family. So here's a, another uh, late onset Mendelian disorder. They're out there, just have to look for them, think about them. So <clears throat> that's all I'm going to say about the prominence uh, of Mendelian disorders. Now I want to talk briefly about finding the responsible variants in genes. So uh, I think probably everybody in the audience knows that Mende uh, uh, geneticists, human geneticists, since there have been human geneticists, have been interested in finding the genes and variants responsible for Mendelian phenotypes. So Archibald Garrett in 1902 re reported uh, patients with alcaptonuria and noticed that the 
distribution of affected individuals within families was entirely consistent with um, uh, what uh, Gregor Mendel had described in 1865 and that um, uh, uh, he hypothesized at that time that maybe alcaptonuria a disorder in tyrosine degradation was in, in fact one of these Mendelian disorders that this monk uh, described uh, 30 years earlier in pea plants. Uh, and then the number of recognized human disorders began to grow and the geneticists, once we understood that uh, the, uh, the factors that were responsible were actually uh, encoded in the DNA, we began to look for the genes and variants responsible. And typically we used really uh, uh, tedious strategies, uh, linkage with collecting large families and doing linkage analysis or searching for a uh, chromosomal uh, aberration that pointed to a particular region in the genome where we might find that gene. But things changed uh, with the Genome Project, as I said, and with the development of next generation sequencing. And I refer you, if you're interested in this, to two uh, papers. Uh, the one on top in particular is really a seminal paper in this field. So this is a paper from uh, our colleagues at the University of Washington, most notably uh, Mike Bamshed, Debbie Nickerson, and Jay Shanduri. And they were working on uh, the development of uh, so-called next generation sequencing and, and genomic studying the human genome. And they did a simple experiment, really, but it's very elegant. They said, you know, we're able now to sequence the genome and particularly the exome, which is about 1.5 percent of the total genome, the exome being the coding sequences, the protein coding sequences. Um, we're able to sequence that pretty well and we have this reference. So uh, what would be the chance? that we, um, if we get a patient with a, a, a particular Mendelian disorder, we could simply do a whole exome sequence and recognize the variants or variants that were responsible for the, for the phenotype. So that sounds like a straightforward hypothesis, but the problem is when you do a whole exome sequence, or the problem is fundamentally that each of us differ by about three million single nucleotide variants from the reference genome. So you have to find which of those three million variants which single usually uh, of the three million variants is really responsible for the phenotype. Now, if you focus on the exome, you cut that number way down, maybe 25,000 variants from the reference sequence in someone's exome, but you're still a long ways from figuring out what the responsible gene is. So what they did, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but they, they took a set of patients with a very well characterized um, Mendelian phenotype, namely Freeman-Sheldon syndrome. The disease gene was already known, MYH3, and they said, let's sequence one patient with uh, Freeman-Sheldon syndrome and see if we can find the variants. And they, they found, actually, they looked only for severe loss of function variants, uh, indels, splice site changes, and nonsense mutations. And at sequencing that one patient, they had several hundred variants that might be candidates for this particular disease. So then they said, uh, well, okay. Let's get another unrelated patient, and we'll do the same thing, and we'll look for genes that are affected in both of these two unrelated individuals, the hypothesis being since we see that they both have Freeman-Sheldon syndrome, they should have a variant in the same mutation. Notice they left out the problem of locus heterogeneity, which would have killed this experiment, but they did very careful clinical phenotyping. So they, they sequenced the second one, and they looked only for genes that had a loss of function variant in both individuals. And I forget the exact numbers, but they were down to about 100 uh, genes at that point. Then they did, well, that looks good. Let's do another one. They did another one, and they were down to, I think, something like seven or eight genes. And they did a fourth, and they only, there was only one gene that had uh, loss of function variants in all four individuals, and that was MYH3, the gene that they already knew that was responsible for this phenotype. So that said, unambiguously, that you could use genomic technology based on next generation sequencing and what we know about the reference human genome to find the variants responsible for human disease. And you don't have to do big, timely linkage studies or anything like that. You just have to find some well-characterized patients and sequence those patients either uh, as singletons in their family or, depending on the inheritance modes, you might want to take a few other people from the family and use those Mendelian segregation rules to help you sort through the variants as well as comparing patients one family to the next. So that said, okay, guys, this is a new age. Let's go get them. 
We did a paper shortly thereafter, which I like to think contributed a little bit to this effort, and that's the reference below. And uh, for those of you that are students in the room, I think this is a very illustrative example. We were, had a speaker at Hopkins, uh, David Goldstein, a great uh, human geneticist, and he was having lunch with the students, as, we often, as often happens. And he said he was working on whole genome sequencing in this case, and he was looking to see if he could solve an unsolved Mendelian disorder uh, using whole genome sequence, sequencing. Now, uh, you know, many of us, myself included, if we were sitting around the lunch table and we heard that, uh, we would say, great, and then we would forget it a couple hours later and that would be the end of it. Fortunately, uh, Nada Sabrea, the lead uh, author on this paper, who was at that time a human genetics graduate student, is quite persistent. And uh, two days later, she called up David Goldstein. She said she had a family and she sent him the DNA. So uh, she did. The family was provided by Julie Huberfong, one of my clinical colleagues. And <clears throat> the family had something called metachondromatosis. And uh, David did the whole genome sequence in about uh, two and a half weeks, actually. Now, if you do whole genome sequence, as I said, you're going to find three million uh, single nucleotide variants compared to the reference sequence, and you'll find some structural variants as well. So we said, wow, this is really a difficult problem. What can we do to help us? And so the only reason I mentioned this paper is because we then went back to genetics. So this first paper is all genomics. We used genetics. We said, okay, uh, we actually, this family was not big enough to do uh, convincing linkage analysis, uh, that is to find an un a region of the genome that unambiguously har harbored, harbored the uh, responsible variant. But recall that linkage is actually very powerful at eliminating regions of the genome that can't possibly have the thing, have the causative gene. So we did some quick uh, SNP nucleotide um, uh, uh, linkage panels on a few other family members, very cheap compared to whole genome sequencing. And we looked, we quickly found f uh, six regions of the genome that could potentially harbor the um, responsible gene. So. Certainly, we hadn't narrowed it down dramatically, but actually those six regions only comprised 2 percent of the whole genome. So we were eliminated 98 percent of the genome using that simple genetic trick. So I think of this as combining genomics with classical genetics. And sure enough, under the second linkage peak that we looked at, there was the responsible gene with an unambiguous loss of function mutation, and we were able to find another family with the same phenotype that had a nonsense mutation in the same gene, PTPN11. So, um, QED, and that whole exercise took about uh, six weeks. So at that time, that was going pretty fast. So genomics, and particularly genomics combined with genetics, offers powerful reagents or tools to get at these disorders, these genes. Okay, so that was uh, a few years ago, and uh, with that sort of stimulus, and because of all the other reasons that I've already enumerated. One of the things that's going on in the last few years is what I call the rise of clinical DNA sequencing. So those of you that see patients know that increasingly it's possible to use uh, molecular diagnostic tools uh, to make, uh, to search for a precise molecular diagnosis in your patient. So uh, I just want to review that because I find that people don't really, uh, have not really thought through all of the approaches and what they mean. So I organize uh, sequencing, clinical sequencing by target. So <clears throat> the first is a very focused search, and that's a single disease gene, think BRCA1. And so you have a patient who, let's say, has breast cancer, maybe a positive family history, and you want to find out if that patient uh, has breast cancer because they have a pathological variant in BRCA1. So you look at that single gene, one of 20,000 genes. Now, uh, a second strategy is what's come to be called a disease gene panel. I mentioned the cardiomyopathy patients. So we know of on the order of 25 to 30 genes that when, uh, they, uh, that when certain variants occur in those genes, the patient will present at different age ranges with dilated cardiomyopathy. So there's a, uh, several panels that one can send such patients' DNA samples and get tested for all of those 25 or 30 genes. So it's a collection of genes, each known to be responsible for a particular disease, and you're asking which of these genes, if any, uh, 
is responsible for my patient's problem. Then uh, whole exome sequencing, I've already referred to this, sequencing the entire exome together with the splice sites flanking each exon. Um, and we, uh, by back of the envelope calculations, which I believe have withstood the test of time, estimated early on that whole exome sequencing, uh, the, that about 85% of Mendelian variants would be found in the exome and in the flanking uh, intronic splice sites. And I won't go into how that uh, comes, but there's actually fairly good evidence for that. So this is a pretty, uh, you, you essentially only have to sequence 1.5% of the genome, but you have a very high chance of finding the genes that are responsible for your patient's uh, problem. And then there's whole genome sequencing that I also mentioned, the sequencing the entire gene, uh, genome, exons, introns, regulatory sequences. Uh, you know, 1.5% uh, of the genome is exome. If you look at what fraction of the genome is highly conserved evolutionarily, it's about 5 to 10 percent, maybe 7 percent. That means that evolution seems to really care about 7 percent of the genome. So you're still sequencing a lot of the genome that perhaps is not really very important when you do a whole genome sequence. And obviously we're much, much, much less uh, sophisticated in interpreting the results of variants that we discover in the non-coding part of the genome as compared to the coding part of the genome. So uh, let me diverge briefly to just make sure everyone's clear on the difference between clinical and research whole exome sequencing. So research whole exome sequencing, uh, typically you have a clinical diagnosis, but you don't know what gene is responsible. And uh, you want to find that gene for this particular phenotype, the gene that's responsible for this particular phenotype. So you typically sequence multiple members of a family, maybe two affected and one unaffected, or maybe the proband and the two parents, depending on the, the inheritance model and what samples are available. Speed is typically not that critical, so it may be months going on here. Surveys all 20 or 21,000 protein coding genes. It requires validation once you find some candidate genes and variants, and we do that validation by segregation within the family to the extent that we have uh, family members and uh, depending on what we think the, men the inheritance pattern is, and functional studies of the uh, candidate genes to make sure that the variants do what we think they do. Uh, then there's clinical whole exome sequencing, and there are a number now of uh, 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 commercial uh, compa companies that provide this service. Um, so typically, uh, a, pa a physician sees a patient in a clinic and doesn't know the diagnosis and says, I'm, rather than sort of spend a lot of time working up this, doing various sort of classical workups, I'm just going to send a clinical whole exome uh, test and see uh, what uh, this tells me. And um, you typically send the patient, and for some of the uh, uh, commercial operations, you also send the parents or some other family member, and they may do the proband's clinical whole exome, and then if they find something that looks interesting, they may look at that particular variant in other members of the family, or they may not. Um, and the key, this is the key point, for most clinical um, whole exome services, the genes they look at are the known disease genes. So in other words, right now, I'll show you later, there are about uh, 3,500 known disease genes out of the 20,000 in your genome. So those, although they sequence the whole exome, they focus on those known disease genes. So in that sense, the uh, efforts for the Mendelian centers and other investigators doing research uh, and finding and validating disease genes through research whole exomes then provide the knowledge for the uh, uh, commercial clinical services to, to, to offer their services. So I didn't make a slide of it, but I was looking at a, a company in Europe uh, last night on their website, and it says on the website, you open it up and it says clinical whole exome sequencing. So I read that and I think, okay, they're surveying 20,000 genes, but then they say, we give you results on 2,800 genes, so that's, they're really only giving you results on maybe 10 or 15 percent of the genes in the genome. Now eventually, as the research progresses, they'll give a higher and higher fraction, but that's the relationship between research whole exome sequencing and clinical whole exome sequencing. Uh, 
Now, <clears throat> one, uh, two, two other things that you have to be clear on when you order these kinds of tests. There are some unanti unanticipated, or if you think about it, they're actually anticipated, uh, consequences of uh, large-scale DNA sequencing. The first is uh, our, our state of knowledge right now is imperfect. So you will find, you will absolutely, if you cast a broad enough net, you will absolutely find variants that you're not sure how to interpret. And they've come to be called variants of unknown significance, or VUSs. And I'll tell you how many you find in a minute. And then you also may find incidental findings of great medical consequence. So you may, you know, be, uh, let's say, doing a clinical whole exome on a child who has some uh, developmental defect or something like that. And so you want to find the gene that is responsible for the developmental defect. And you do that whole exome sequencing, and you find... Uh, a well-known pathological variant in BRCA1. Now, when the family gave permission to do that test, they were not thinking about BRCA1, BRCA1, and that variant almost certainly had nothing to do with why the exome was ordered. But now you have a piece of information that may be very relevant to that individual's uh, long-term, long-term medical care. And... That variant may also be in other members of the family. So you found out some information not only about your patient, but also about family members. So th the best way to deal with this possibility is to discuss it with the family before you, you send the test so that everybody has got their eyes wide open about what you're doing. Medicine has always picked up incidental findings. Uh, you know, you, send, you think the patient is anemic, you send a CBC, and you discover that they have leukemia. Or something like that. But what's different about these findings is that they may predict illness way down the road that have absolutely nothing to do with why you ordered the test, and they also may pr provide information that's relevant to other family members who are not even your patients. Okay, so let's look back at those four classes of sequencing uh, approaches. So uh, starting on the first row up here, um, uh, single gene testing, BRCA1, I already mentioned, cost uh, several hundred dollars to a few thousand, actually a few thousand. It's, uh, it's less expensive or it's relatively inexpensive if you're correct. That is, maybe you spend $2,500, but you get the answer. You have fewer variants of unknown significance because you're only looking at the variants in a particular gene, and very often those genes have been pretty well studied, so you, you find relatively small numbers. You'll find occasional but relatively small numbers of variants of unknown significance, and no incidental findings because you're only thinking about this particular gene. Now, the second category is a, some sort of disease gene panel. I mentioned cardiomyopathy, maybe 25, uh, depending on when you did the test. The number's going up. Cost is quite similar, actually, several hundred to a few thousand dollars. It's a broader net. It's less expensive on a per-gene basis. And, uh, but you will find more variants of unknown significance. Uh, you won't find incidental findings uh, because you're really just looking at the cardiomyopathy genes. You're not looking beyond that. Uh, now, what about a whole exome sequence, a so-called clinical whole exome sequence? So currently you can get them for around $5,000. It's a much broader net, uh, a bargain on the per-gene basis, right? It's great. Uh, but you will find absolutely many variants of unknown significance, so you'll need to counsel the family about those variants of unknown significance, or you will have to build in some approach that you've agreed beforehand to set those aside. Um, and uh, you'll find incidental findings. I think most groups now are reporting, if you just consider these so-called 56 American College of Medical Genetics genes where a panel of experts decided that, we, that there were reportable and actionable incidental findings, uh, and you say, how often do you find variants in those 56 genes which seem to be significant? Most people who are doing a lot of whole exome sequencing are finding on the order of 1% to 3% of the people they do whole exome sequencing on will have incidental findings in that small number of 56 very solidly known disease genes. And then a whole genome sequence. Uh, largely a research tool at this time, but several companies are beginning to suggest it. Uh, more expensive, 
uh, it's a broader net still. It's the broadest net we can currently cast, uh, although RNA-seq will be coming down the pike. Um, and um, it's much, much, much harder to interpret. Uh, you will find variants of unknown significance and incidental findings galore. So uh, one take-home message is that uh, if you're going to use this uh, in, outside of the research setting, you should, we think, uh, build in uh, a good bit of genetic counseling time uh, for those subjects that have this to explain all this stuff. Now, what is, uh, as I've indicated, clinical, particularly clinical whole exome panels, genes, and clinical whole exome is a growing field. So what have been the outcomes? So we're beginning to see publications now that are looking to see what has been the consequence of this. So the first publication, I think, uh, uh, any, of any size was from Baylor College of Medicine that very quickly opened a commercial lab associated with their genetics group uh, to provide clinical whole exome sequencing. So they reported in this reference on the first 2,000 samples they did. 88% uh, were in the pediatric age range. They made a molecular diagnosis in 25% of these patients. So that's a pretty good return on a diagnostic uh, test rate. Right, 25 percent. Um, and interestingly, 58 percent of the diagnostic mutations had not previously been reported. That is to say, you, they found a loss of function allele uh, in a gene that was known to cause a phenotype when it had loss of function. And so this is just a new loss of function variant in this known disease gene. The frequency of the, inher uh, the various inheritance patterns are shown there for the solved cases. A key thing is that 30% of the diagnoses involved a disease gene that was identified in the last three years. So this gets back to this, the research community, particularly research whole, whole exomes, pumping in new disease genes, and those new, digi, new disease genes then can add to the list of uh, genes that the clinical uh, West can interpret accurately. So it's really uh, going uh, up like a rocket right now. And one interesting feature, which has been found over and over again now, is that 23 of the patients for which they got an answer, or 4.6 percent, actually had what they called a blended phenotype from two different Mendelian disorders. So in medicine, we're taught, you know, it's a sort of an Occam's razor approach, and you're trying always to find a diagnosis that will explain everything about your patient. So one of the reasons that these patients were difficult to diagnose is because they actually had two diseases, two rare diseases in one, and the phenotype had features of both of these dis disorders, and so clinical geneticists were not able to recognize what it was. So very interesting. Now, uh, GeneDx, another private uh, laboratory service here in Rockville, Maryland, does excellent work. Uh, very shortly thereafter reported 3,040 consecutive probands, nearly all in the pediatric age range. They made a molecular diagnosis in 851, or 28.8 percent, roughly the same as the Baylor uh, lab had found. And again, uh, 28 of the patients, or 3.3 percent, had two or three Mendelian disorders. And uh, this graph, which I won't say much about, but shows the uh, test yield in terms of percentage of positive results by the particular systems that were involved. So actually the highest system is uh, uh, hearing loss, which has a, already known to have a huge uh, contribution of genetic uh, causation to isolated hearing loss. Uh, so those two studies were largely pediatric. Baylor recently reported 486 consecutive adult patients, 18 or older. And they made a molecular diagnosis a little bit younger, a little bit less in this older group, 17.5 percent. And they found 6 or 7 percent with two disorders. And this graph shows the diagnostic rate with the age of, of the patient in years. So uh, the older the patient got, uh, the less uh, chance they had of finding a straightforward Men Mendelian disorder. And this is a plot much like the GeneDx plot, and it shows the success rate by indication and the overall diagnostic rate of 17.5 percent. So even in adult population, at least young and middle-aged adults suspected of having a Mendelian disease, uh, this turns out to be a very high-yield high uh, diagnostic service. Now, uh, to, for those of you that are not physicians in the room, let me just emphasize uh, 
some values for having a precise diagnosis. So uh, physicians are trying to explain the phenotype of the clinical problem of their patients so they can have a continuous uh, diagnostic workup until they get the answer. So this stops that diagnostic workup. Work up. It shortcuts it. Uh, it, un it ends the uncertainty of the diagnostic odyssey. This is the term that's been given to families or patients that keep coming back to medical attention and trying over and over again to find out what in the world is their problem. Uh, it turns out that if you have a child with a problem or you yourself have a problem, there's a, for most affected individuals, there's a strong urge to find out exactly what you have uh, and that you're not when you go to your doctor and say, I've got this problem, that problem, you're not crazy, you actually have some problem. And it provides a biological explanation for the problem. So over and over again, those of you that have been to a genetics clinic, if you talk to parents who have a child with some genetic disorder, the parents will say things like, um, well, uh, you know, I thought uh, actually, you know, three months into this pregnancy, I fell on the ice, I took a bad fall, and um, <clears throat> I always thought that the reason that my baby was, had this problem was because I fell down. Uh, and you say, no, actually, this is a straightforward genetic disease. The fact that you fell down or that you had a glass of wine or you had a cold or something like that is irrelevant uh, to this problem. Uh, it puts the focus on patient management and, I mean, it focuses the patient management. Now you know what you're dealing with, and so you can draw from experience with other people with that problem. And it informs the family of the recurrence risk. In other words, um, you know, if it's a recessive disorder, they have a 1 in 4, 25 percent chance of having another. And I certainly have been in the, uh, I've had the unfortunate experience. Uh, I remember a case of Hurler syndrome, which is a very high burden lysosomal storage disease. The patient was referred relatively late, so the patient was about 18 months old, and the family came in with this 18-month-old boy that from down the hall you could tell had Hurler syndrome, but they had a three-month-old child sitting on the mother's knee, and I could tell that that three-month-old child also probably had that disorder, uh, and they've now, both of those kids have now died. But if the diagnosis had been made quickly and the family informed, then they would not have had to go through six or eight years of very high burden chronic illness with those two kids. So that's a big uh, benefit. So I'll give you this one example. <clears throat> this is a patient that I've been following uh, for 36 years. He's 39 right now. Uh, in fact, I'm scheduled to see him two weeks from now. Uh, he had recurrent episodes of lactic acidosis from early childhood. He had uh, diminished intellectual uh, function for his family with uh, six, an IQ of 65 and uh, cortical atrophy on his uh, CNS imaging studies. He had uh, mild to moderate cardiomyopathy, and he had uh, prominent dysfunction of his autonomic nervous system constipation, postural hypotension, other such things as that. And, <clears throat> and he would come in with these episodes of recurrent lactic acidosis. We would say over and over again, this is something is wrong with the function of your mitochondria. This is some sort of mitochondrial misfunction, but we're not sure what it is. Uh, several years ago, uh, we finally were able to get money together to, do, to sequence his mitochondrial genome. And I told the mother that, you know, his problem, if his problem was, as I suspected, mitochondrial, it could either be in the mitochondrial genome or the nuclear genome. At least we could check out the mitochondrial genome, uh, and it turned out to be normal. So I had to go back to her and say, well, the mitochondrial genome is normal, so I'm thinking it's probably a mitochondrial, a gene that encodes a mitochondrial protein in the nuclear genome. At that point, it was out of the question, not, not only for that family, but just in general to sequence, let's say, a whole exome. Uh, but eventually, uh, about two years ago, um, <clears throat> we, uh, she got uh, financial resources and insurance to actually pay for a clinical whole exome sequence, and he has a homozygous nonsense mutation, a gene called FBXL4, never heard of it before until the test was done, but it is a previously described, three or four other patients, mitochondrial DNA depletion, 
syndrome, the encoded protein is necessary for proper uh, replication of mitochondrial DNA. And so if you lack that protein, your mitochondria don't have as many mitochondrial genomes as they should. The end result is your mitochondria don't work well. So I had the pleasure, actually, of telling the mother that after 36 years, I finally had a diagnosis. The mother was incredibly relieved, actually, to know exactly what this is. I couldn't, I said, you know, I don't, uh, I, I really don't, there's nothing I can do about this. So it's, it's not that it's going to lead to a better treatment. Maybe down the road it will, but not right now. But at least we know. And the relief of just having the knowledge uh, of exactly what was the etiology of this boy's problem was palpable in, to the, for this woman. Really amazing. Okay, <clears throat> so then I want to turn to one other publication about clinical whole ex exome sequencing, which just came out. It's a prospective evaluation of whole exome sequencing as a first-tier molecular test in infants with suspected monogenic disorders. It's from the Murdoch Institute in Australia. That's the first author in the reference. And <clears throat> they, uh, they did some sort of thoughtful modifications of the sort of rather than the sort of shotgun whole exome, clinical whole exome uh, uh, diagnostic testing. So they considered using this test in 119 infants, unrelated infants, uh, that met a set of criteria. They had a well-defined phenotype. Uh, some of them had a positive family history and so forth. Uh, of those 119 families, 80 uh, agreed to participate. They did a single clinical whole exome sequence, that is, they didn't do any other family members, and they examined in that uh, uh, clinical exome 2,830 of the 20,000 genes. And uh, they excluded, to get rid of the problem with late onset incidental findings, they said, we're not going to look at those, we're not going to look at certain genes that have those incidental findings. So they excluded 122 genes, uh, they didn't analyze those genes. Uh, 40, they, uh, of, of the 80 infants that were sequenced, 46 or 57 percent uh, yielded a molecular, precise molecular diagnosis. And of these, of the 46, 32 percent had a significant management change based on this new diagnostic information. So it turned out to be of quite uh, important medical significance to about a third of the patients at this point followed for a few months or a year. And uh, additionally, 28 couples, 28 of the 80 couples that participated received a uh, high uh, uh, either 25 percent or 50 percent recurrence rate, so they could use that information to avoid the scenario that I discussed earlier. So uh, it will be interesting to follow these studies now and to ask what does this mean for the sort of medical economic issues? Was this initial investment in a rather expensive test, uh, does it uh, not only improve the medical care, but does it, does it reduce medical uh, costs as the families go forward? I suspect strongly that it will, uh, but some uh, medical economic, economics experts need to look at this in quite in, in long in detail uh, so that we can get these data. We desperately need those data. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about clinical sequencing uh, and its. Uh, value and its uh, uh, aspects that need to be uh, managed carefully if you're going to use it in your clinic or with your patients. But the growth of uh, uh, the ability to detect Mendelian disease genes and the value of detecting them led uh, the Genome Institute to uh, issue an RFA to develop centers for Mendelian uh, genomics that would use the technologies that I talked to, genomics and genetics, to try to find as many uh, genes responsible for Mendelian disorders as possible. And in the initial four-year funding period, uh, three centers were funded, uh, UW at uh, University of Washington in Seattle, Debbie Nickerson and Mike Bamshed, uh, the PIs, uh, Yale. Uh, with the PI Rick Lifton, and we partnered with Baylor College of Medicine to form what we call the Baylor uh, Hopkins uh, Center for Mendelian Genomics. And uh, I'm a PI along with uh, Jim Lufsky down at uh, Baylor, so it's a real team effort. Uh, and there's our website, mendeliangenomics.org. And you'll see me refer to it as BHCMG, Baylor Hopkins Center for Mendelian Genomics.
We just started our second four-year funding period, and I just was at a meeting Monday and Tuesday of this week where we're sort of uh, tooling up again for the next four-year uh, run at this. So uh, it's interesting to say, well, what is the current state of the art? So we keep track of how many Mendelian disease genes have been identified by uh, using the data in Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, or OMIM, which was started by my colleague, now deceased, Victor McCusick, and currently managed by my colleague, Ada Hamish at Hopkins. And um, currently, OMIM, as of late last night, lists about 7,500 Mendelian phenotypes. Um, it lists uh, 3,543 disease genes. Uh, that's about 18% of the total. You'll notice that the number of phenotypes is greater than the number of disease genes. That's because, um, in part, that, um, uh, that well, the next column is explained phenotypes, 5,722. That number is bigger than 3,543. And that's because some disease genes uh, cause uh, two different or sometimes more discrete phenotypes that clinically we would have never imagined were caused by mutations in the same gene. There are some genes, uh, Lamin A, for example, that account for 13 or 14 discrete uh, clinical phenotypes. So the average is about 1.8 phenotypes per disease gene right now. And there's still 1,800 explained, unexplained phenotypes in OMIM, and you have to realize that there are new phenotypes coming into OMIM all the time. They come in at a rate of about 300 new phenotypes per year. So uh, there's lots of uh, Mendelian disease out there that we have not yet recognized as being Mendelian disease, or we've not given a name to or an OMIM number yet. So 18% of the total genome number of genes in the genome have t been tagged as Mendelian disease genes, so we have a long way to go if, uh, depending on your view of how many uh, genes in the genome can cause a Mendelian phenotype. So let me talk about that for a, mi a minute. How many Mendelian disease genes are there in our genome, and how close is that 3,500 to saturation? So first of all, how would I define a Mendelian disease gene? And I would define it uh, as those genes in which some fraction of variants in that gene produce highly penetrant phenotypes. That's sort of genetics speak. Uh, penetrance means that you manifest a phenotype when you have the genetic variant. Um, and if I ask my colleagues, how high does the penetrance have to be to call something a Mendelian disease? There's no unanimity. So I arbitrarily take uh, the pen set the penetrance level at 0.7. So that means that if you have the variant, the genetic variant, your chance of getting the phenotype is 70% or better. For example, the standard uh, disease variants in BRCA1, many of them have penetrances in the range of 70%. So that means you're highly likely to get the phenotype, but it also means that some people won't. And the ones that don't get the phenotype, geneticists refer to as non-penetrant. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So with that sort of background, then you say, well, one way I might be able to get at how many Mendelian disease genes are, there are is to count the phenotypes. Well, it's a, it turns out it's a lot harder to count phenotypes than it is to count genes. So as I said, OMIM currently lists 7,500 with about 1.8 phenotypes per disease gene and 1,800 unexpli unexplained phenotypes, so that predicts maybe 900 more disease genes, a pretty small number, actually. But we know that many phenotypes are conditional and dependent on uh, environmental variables. So think of G6PD deficiency. People with G6PD deficiency are typically entirely asymptomatic unless they happen to chow down on a plate of fava beans, in which case they will have massive hemolysis and become jaundiced and perhaps severely anemic. So that's you have a, we all think that G6PD is a Mendelian disease, but if you avoid all of the environmental triggers that cause that hemolysis, you'll never know that you have that Mendelian phenotype. There are many other phenotypes of this nature. So the point is that to define all uh, Mendelian disease genes and all variants that cause in those genes that cause Mendelian disease, you have to uh, sort of challenge the population with a variety of environmental triggers to see what brings out the clinical phenotype easy to do in a mouse, a little bit harder to do in a person. Uh, 
and the other thing is that there are a vast number of unrecognized phenotypes. Remember I said that 300 come in, new phenotypes come into OMIM each year. They're not, obviously they're not new phenotypes. They've been there all along. We're just recognizing them and getting them into medical attention. And there are vast swaths of the population of homo sapiens around the world that don't even sort of get access to this kind of uh, service. So um, uh, I've recently visited the Middle East and I saw uh, my host showed me just one family after another that had genetic things that I had never seen before, but clearly based on the Mendelian segregation in the family were clearly Mendelian, so they're just waiting to be explained. So <clears throat> there's sort of two uh, schools of thought about how many Mendelian disease genes are in the genome. Here's one that says that the number of uh, genes in the genome that when ha they have a certain variant could cause a highly penetrant phenotype is substantial but limited. So let's say arbitrarily here I put it 30 percent. Now there's another school of thought that says actually if you look carefully enough and across the uh, whole, the entire population of Homo sapiens, you'll find that a large fraction, 90 percent or more of genes can produce a Mendelian phenotype when they have a particular class of variants in that gene. And um, the answer to this question is not known, okay? I, I'm, uh, obviously, I guess you would, you would predict this. I'm greatly in favor of the red curve. I think uh, if we look carefully enough and long enough, we'll find Mendelian phenotypes for almost every gene in the genome. Now, let me just give you a couple of reasons why I think that's true. So the biggest one is this. Uh, it's evolutionary thinking. If those genes are not important for something, uh, evolution would get rid of them, right? There's constant mutation rate. Uh, all DNA segments in the genome accu uh, accumulate mutation, and if, they, if that mutation occurs in uh, genes with important function, then selection eliminates them. So the set of genes that we have right now have stood the test of time uh, evolution, by evolutionary uh, guidelines. And so um, it's true that some of them may have been more valuable in earlier uh, socioeconomic uh, cultural conditions of our species, but uh, nevertheless, the vast majority of them are there and because evolution cares about them. So, well, so then you could ask, well, okay, uh, Valley, if you think the fraction of Mendelian genes is so large, why are, they, why, aren't, why are they so difficult to identify? So the first answer that most people give is, well, maybe a substantial fraction of the genes in our genome are so important uh, that when there is a significant variation in those genes, it leads to early onset developmental lethals. And so those fetuses are uh, uh, only known in terms of spontaneous abortions. And it is true that there are fr a fraction of our genes in the genome that are very, very highly conserved. Uh, and that suggests, by very, very highly conserved, I mean the uh, nucleotide sequence and the amino acid sequence of the encoded protein are highly, highly conserved, and that suggests that they are intolerant to variation. Um, and uh, we know that our species has a high frequency of spontaneous first trimester abo spontaneous abortions. A large fraction of those are chromosomal abnormalities, but there are other uh, spontaneous uh, first trimester abortions in which the karyotype appears normal. So why, what's going on there? So how many of those might be Mendelian disorders that uh, affect some gene that is absolutely important for early embryonic uh, development. So that remains to be seen. We also know that 30 percent, and this statistic is often used, 30 percent of, of the genes in the mouse genome when uh, uh, made homozygous for a null allele, a true knockout, lead to uh, spontaneous uh, uh, well, fetal losses, okay? either perinatal or earlier in, in embryos. So that says, indeed, a fraction of the mouse genes, 30% um, uh, of the mouse genes are, are uh, absolutely necessary for normal development. So you're not going to see 
So th then the logic is, well, you won't see those genes causing medical problems in later life. So uh, I would argue that's not the case because we know that every gene that we've looked at, there's a spectrum of uh, mutational events from those mutations that cause a complete loss of function to those mutations that moderately decrease function to those mu mutations that only mildly decrease function. So somewhere in that spectrum of functional consequence, there will be some alleles for these very genes that uh, only reduce the function of the protein product by some fraction, and that allows for uh, in successful, uh, at least viable, in utero development, and then will make itself known um, uh, either in infancy or later in life, depending on how uh, uh, the biology of that gene and the severity of that mutation. So, uh, you know, we used to say, for example, uh, that um, uh, Rett syndrome is only seen in uh, females, and uh, that's a, it's an X-linked gene, and uh, that it must be a developmental lethal for males. But once the gene was cloned, we did find a small number of males that survive embryonic development and have mutations in NECP2. Uh, uh, so those are variants that are hypomorphs that make it to extra human life. So I think that this um, mouse knockout experience and the human knockout experience will show us genes that are really critical, but it doesn't mean that they won't present with Mendelian disease depending on the allele. Now, another reason that they're difficult, Mendelian disease genes are difficult to identify is that our phenotyping is incomplete and or insensitive. So uh, the phenotyping in humans is largely a standard medical exam, and then if it's a research project, we may do some other kind of fancier testing. Um, but um, we often, basically that phenotyping is routine phenotyping or maybe what I would call uninformed phenotyping. You're not thinking about a particular system when you do the phenotyping. Uh, and it'd be better to have directed phenotyping, that is where we're thinking about particular biological systems that might account for this patient's problem, uh, or iterative, even better, or in addition to iterative phenotyping where we go back to the patient over and over again as we learn more about their condition and look for more subtle uh, uh, abnormalities. Another problem with phenotyping is that we have technological limitations we only measure certain things. And there are big whole systems, biological systems of unequivocal importance that we don't mention, that we don't really measure. Uh, so the one I like to think of is a protein turnover by ubiquitination. If you're in, in the clinic, you can't send a ubiquitin level. You don't look at ubiquitinated proteins. Uh, you don't really, we don't really assess the protein turnover pathways. Uh, we know now from whole genome or whole exome sequencing or other genomic approaches that mutations in those pathways do cause disease, for example, certain forms of Parkinsonism. So in contrast to serum sodium or uh, liver enzymes, we just don't measure, measure that biological system very well. So if we're not measuring it, we're not going to find those phenotypes, except that we come at it through the genomic approach. Um, and then the, the thing I've already mentioned, the conditional nature of some phenotypes a patient, a person can be apparently completely normal, and then when exposed to a particular uh, uh, environmental uh, stress, like the man we described at the beginning of this talk, I described at the beginning of this talk, the phenotype becomes apparent. And the last explanation is that uh, biological gene products don't work in isolation. Protein, the pr protein products of genes don't work in isolation. They work in complex biological systems. And those systems have evolved to have buffering, that is, the ability to maintain homeostasis when perturbed, either by environmental variables or genetic variables. And much of that buffering and robust robustness comes, or some of it at least, comes from redundancy of biological systems. So you have two biological systems, and they do much the same thing. Now, I would submit, if you look carefully, most uh, cases of redundancy are what I would call incomplete redundancy. They sort of cross cover one another, but you can find conditions where only one of the two uh, systems really handles it and other conditions where the other system handles it. So that means that there will be times when you find uh, phenotypes in there. So I already alluded to this mouse experience, about 30% are lethal, lethals, but all viable mice, a large fraction, or nearly all viable mice, do have phenotypic features. And the, the point is that these uh, mouse knockouts are 
essentially almost all 100% null alleles. We don't know much about other model systems. Um, there's a spectrum, the spectrum of uh, phenotypic consequences depending on the allele and the genotype is well exam exemplified by mutations in a gene called LBR. They're homozygous loss of function. You get a, a developmental lethal, basically. Um, if you're homozygous for uh, m only moderate loss of functions, you may have a skeletal dysplasia, uh, but you live a full lifespan. And uh, for heterozygotes, for certain alleles, all you have is an abnormality in the morphology of the nuclear, uh, of the nucleus of polymorphonuclear uh, leukocytes called the pelzer hue anomaly. So a whole span of phenotypic severity all due to different mutations at that particular locus. So if we want to find all the Mendelian genes, we have to figure out ways of casting a wide net, lots of people. Uh, lots of phenotyping uh, and, and uh, uh, looking carefully and rigorously. Now, another system, I just mentioned this, that is undoubtedly uh, important, but we don't phenotype it at all, is the olfactory system. That we have about a 1,000 olfactory receptor genes in our genome. We all know that some people have very exquisitely sensitive uh, ability to smell, and other people can't smell anything. The men in the room probably have been told by their wife, can't you smell that? And you say, I can't smell that. And um, so it turns out that the olfactory receptor collection is highly polymorphic. And if you study people's olfactory capabilities, you find wide, wide, wide variations. We just don't phenotype it. We sort of think, well, it's really not that important, right? But it does influence, it, influ it actually has been shown to influence mate selection. It influences uh, certain things that you do in your life. And if you look at other species uh, other than us, it's critically important. For example, in mice, um, blind mice function perfectly well, and they can't function if they have no olfactory ability. So they live in an olfactory world rather than a visual world. So, and there are a few Mendelian disorders of uh, olfaction that have been discovered, but largely it's a whole swath of the genome we don't pay any attention to. And I just emphasize this point about uh, conditional phenotypes with this one disorder I already mentioned, G6PD deficiency. Here's a boy uh, that presented uh, with seizures, hypoglycemia, and hyperammonemia 36 hours into an episode of viral gastro gastroenteritis when he was 18 months old. Uh, he uh, ultimately turned out to have something called medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. We actually screen for it now in the neonates. He was born before the screening in a state where the screening um, program was not in place. Uh, the point of importance here, though, is that this is an inborn error in the beta oxidation of fats, and it only comes to medical attention when you put stress on the beta oxidation pathway. So typically for children, uh, that happens when they get their first bout of viral gastroenteritis. What happens? The baby does, doesn't feel good, doesn't eat well. The parents put the baby to bed without eating much supper. About 4 o'clock in the morning, now having fasted for 14 hours, the longest the kid has fasted in their entire life, they wake up seizing and hyperammonemic and uh, in metabolic crisis. Before the screening program, 25% of the children with this disorder, uh, that first episode was fatal. If you simply make the diagnosis, and you avoid fasting, in other words, you avoid stressing the beta oxidation system, these people do fine. And he's not had any difficulty uh, since the diagnosis was made, and he's now a young man with two children of his own. We, of course, did what? We checked his, once we made the diagnosis, we checked his siblings, and it turns out his older brother also has MCAD deficiency, and it had one explained nearly fatal illness in childhood. Uh, that was caused, it was called uh, anecteric hepatitis. Uh, and, uh, but he had, that was an a, a episode of med, MedCAD uh, problem. So you only see it when the, environmental, the environment is stressed, uh, it leads to stress on this uh, uh, system. So we're going to learn a lot about this, I think, from the Undiagnosed Disease Network uh, project that really got started here by the work of Bill Gall and in mice on the not, mice knockout project, so-called COMP. And it uh, shows the tremendous value of education. If you, you can't, it's difficult to treat the genetic disorder, uh, correct the genetic disorder, but simple education of the patient, the family, and the 
primary care physician can really make a life uh, difference between life and death in, in this disorder. And there are other disorders. And then the buffering and robustness really goes back to this man we heard about at the beginning of the lecture. He was able, through the robustness of biological systems, a waste nitrogen excretion. Turns out the urea cycle has tremendous buffering capacity so that a 80% reduction in OTC functioning probably leaves you under most conditions to be just fine. It's only when you have tremendous periods of protein breakdown, as he did stimulated by his illness, that you overwhelm that uh, uh, system. So how many Mendelian disease genes? My hypothesis is that if you look carefully and across a large population, nearly all of our geno uh, uh, nearly all the genes in our genome will have uh, Mendelian uh, phenotypes. Not all of my colleagues agree with this, so we'll see. Now, let's come now back to the Centers for Mendelian Genomics who are tasked with finding all of these Mendelian disease genes. So the st overall strategy is to find well-phenotyped cases in families, perform whole exome sequencing on relevant family members, use family relationships, allele frequency data, functional predictions, model organism results, functional studies to identify the responsible genes and variants. It's really a lot of fun, very interesting, very exciting when you get a hit. Uh, and uh, some things you solve right away, and it's uh, everyone jumps for joy, and then other things you plug away at for years and, and don't, uh, we don't solve. Uh, and then we, in the case of the Centers for Mendelian Genomics, uh, we have an online uh, web tool that anybody in the world can submit their cases, and once we get the, uh, analyze the sequence and get uh, an answer, if we do get an answer, we give the information back to the submitter and ask them to write the paper. So they get all that for free. You can get that service at that website. So I, if I'm looking for all the Mendelian disease genes, I liken it to this. I think of the world or the entire population of Homo sapiens as our sort of petri dish, if you will. And we're looking around the world to try to find those families and those individuals will have very rare disorders that represent the phenotype uh, of a particular genetic mutation. So this is a sort of ultimate genotype to phenotype connection. And we're doing pretty well on that. These are the uh, Baylor-Hopkins CMG data as of April 2016. We've got 9,000 uh, consented samples, and we've uh, got samples from 29 countries around the world. There's still big swaths of the population of Homo sapiens, namely India and China, that we're really not getting much uh, uh, access into. Uh, we've developed, as I said, a web-based tool to make it easier for a healthcare professional anywhere around the world to submit a candidate case or family or cohort. These papers describe that tool. It's called PhenoDB. Um, and you can look at PhenoDB. You could just, it's free. You just go in, you put in your, you register with your name and your email and so forth. And then if you have a family or a cohort or whatever, you can enter uh, them in there as long as they're consented appropriately and so forth. And then we have a committee that meets every two weeks, looks at the submissions. The PhenoDB takes all the clinical data in a very ordered fashion so we can quickly review the cases and ask, is this a good family to carry through to the sequencing and analysis part of the effort? This is the home page for PhenoDB. We have users from many, many different countries around the world. Uh, the Baylor-Hopkins instance of PhenoDB, uh, we have uh, data on f more than 4,000 projects in there, including 53 cohorts ranging from 5 to 295 subjects, phenotypic data on more than 10,000 individuals. We have uh, whole exome sequence data uh, on more than 6,000 samples. And there's an analysis tool about how to analyze the results of your whole exome sequencing in the PhenoDB, so it's very convenient because you can go from the analysis back to the phenotype back and forth. And we're continually improving it. Uh, and the we here is largely not a Sabrea, uh, the same woman who, that took Gold, David Goldstein up on his offer to do a whole genome sequence, and uh, Ada Hamish, uh, who's the director of um, OMIM, and then uh, a really uh, accomplished uh, program person named Francois Chivicate. Uh, this is the very, this is when you're analyzing your data. This is the starting page. So you'll see here, in this case, uh, you have a proband, and you're going to look at the sequence of his parent, his or her parents, uh, 
So you put in, you start with three Anavar files. You've selected those. Now you're at this stage. You're putting down the inheritance model that you want to analyze the data, and you pick uh, filters, the frequency of the alleles that you expect. You want to eliminate common variants that are present in these databases. You may want to uh, 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 fine tune the size of indels that you're looking for, and a variety of other uh, variables that you can dial in, and then you just push the button and out comes a list of candidate genes and variants. Um, these Anavar files are created as you upload the VCF, so that's done automatically, and three standard analyses, autosomal dominant, autosomal homozygous, autosomal recessive homozygous, and compound heterozygous are generated automatically, and it automatically creates a file for pathogenic or likely pathogenic incidental findings in the ACMG56 reportable gene flavors, so that it automatically goes to ClinVar and asks, has this variant been uh, seen and is it, how is it classified, and then comes back and gives us a dated uh, time for the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, for the issue of whether or not there are incidental findings. And on the consent form, they check whether they want incidental findings or not. It utilizes the phenotypic inf info in OMIM and the OMIM al algorithm to suggest possible diagnoses when the phenotypes are entered and to flag if you, once you get to candidate genes, if that, those candidate genes have been um, connected to one of the phenotypes that it suggested, uh, it will flag, it will make that connection for you. And there's an API that's the sort of back end, what the computer people call the back end, that transfers the final results, gene names, genomic coordinates, and features to, um, to Gene Matcher, and I'll say a word about that in a minute. It's completely uh, searchable on phenotypic features and uh, genotype features. Uh, and one of the additional tools, so the issue of how do you decide that you've, how do you declare victory? What's the evidence that the variant you have found in a particular gene is responsible for this phenotype? And it turns out one of the most potent ways to do this is to find other patients or model organisms that have variation in the same gene and a similar phenotype. So. Uh, Nada and uh, Francois and Ada developed this, another tool called Gene Matcher, also free to anyone who wants to use it. Um, and there's the website, and uh, it's designed to connect investigators, so anybody can go in and put in their favorite gene, and if someone else has entered that gene into Gene Matcher, then both of you will get an email, and then it's up to you what you want to do with that connection. Uh, all the data is de-identified, so IRV is not required. It's automated and continuous matching. Once you put it in there, it's there for in, until you take it out. And so if someone matches you six months later, you'll just get an email that say you got a match um, and it gives you the contact information. And you can choose to collaborate or not. And it also, we've added, although initially it was just matching on genes, you can click a box and decide to match on phenotypic features as well. That was put in place in October 2015. And it's connected to this matchmaker exchange program I'll describe in a second, but here are the, this is the page in Gene Matcher for your matching options um, by Gene Match, which is required, by Disease Match, which you can ignore or you can say I want it, or the location in the genome, uh, you can, that's optional, or uh, ph uh, phenotypic features match, that's optional. Here's the data from a couple days ago. We had 4,247 genes in uh, Gene Matcher. And there have been two, uh, more than 2,000 matches. Now, uh, we don't know which genes are being matched, and we don't know who matches. So I can't tell you how many of these matches, um, you know, turned out to be lead to productive interactions. I do know uh, that in our, in Baylor Hopkins, we certainly have solved a huge number of cases by this way. We have a strong candidate, but we only have one case. And um, uh, we find other cases with same similar phenotype and similar kinds of uh, variants in the same gene. So currently, more than 1,500 people are using this and from 51 countries. Now, uh, Gene Matcher, which is, this is the matchmaker exchange uh, diagram of all these groups interested in rare phenotypes around the world. And uh, so we, built an API that connects Gene Matcher to Decipher and connects Gene Matcher to Phenome Central. Phenome Central is the 
Care for Rare program in Canada, which are rare diseases in Canada. The Cypher does rare diseases in the UK and throughout uh, Europe and the world. And so if, if you click a button in Gene Matcher, you will not only look in Gene Matcher, but you'll look at uh, Phenome Central and Decipher. So you get that added uh, bang for your buck if you just click it there. The rest of these, some of these others are planning to come in. They just haven't made it happen yet. And as of April, through Gene Matcher, we've made uh, 81 matches through into Phenome Central and 74 matches into Decipher. So those pipelines are working well. Now, uh, I just thought you might be in a, I'm near the end here, but what's the Baylor Hopkins summary data at four years? We've had 9,000 and change consented samples. We've studied 776 phenotypes, 56% 56 of, of those were judged to be novel. Uh, we've done 6,769 exomes. We found uh, a total of uh, 468 disease genes. Of those, 222 were novel disease genes, that is, they had not previously been connected to a phenotype, and uh, 246 were known disease genes. Now, we try in our evaluation of candidate samples to uh, not do things that look like they have a disease that's already well explained. But you have to realize that for many of these Mendelian phenotypes, there are only two or three people in the literature, and so the breadth of the phenotype has not been really fleshed out. So the, the clinicians may look and say, well, this doesn't look like the same thing. Once we find that it's the same gene, then we often see the overlap and realize it's what we call phenotypic expansion, and we're just fleshing out the full breadth of the phenotype. So of these known disease genes, 55% of them, uh, the patients that we studied, had additional phenotypic features that were not described in the entity so far. And it's led to 124 publications uh, currently. Now, finding disease genes, some immediate consequences. It connects the gene to a phenotype, something geneticists have been interested in since they've been geneticists. Connects the phenotype to a biological system, and it tells you something about how that system works, both in normal, under normal circumstances, and under perturbed circumstances. So it's quite powerful. It unravels locus heterogeneity, which turns out to be extensive. Uh, it enables precise diagnosis and counseling, all the stuff we talked about earlier. It's the first step in the path towards informed treatment. At least you know precisely what the problem is, so now you can begin to use rational approaches to try to find a way around it. And it's a tremendous research stimulus from bench to bedside, um, so it's, it's uh, very powerful. Now, some long-term consequences. Uh, suppose, and this gets to our long-term goals, suppose we had phenotypes for more than 50% of the genes in our genome. Remember I said right now it's about 17 or 18%. Um, what questions could we ask? I sort of think of this as the classic forest and trees analogy, right? So we're, right now we're getting very good at finding a particular tree in the forest, and we're going all around it and seeing what, how many branches it has and how tall it is and all its individual variations. But all, and it's very exciting. Yeah, every tree is interesting. But what I'd like to see us do as we get farther along this is to be able to stand back and say, each of these trees is in a forest, that is, in a human being, and um, what are the principles we're learning, not from this individual genetic disorder, but from looking at large numbers of well-explained genetic disorders? Can we see new principles about how disease works, what genes are important, what variants are allowed, tolerated, and so forth? So that's a sort of a long-term goal. It's a broader and uh, uh, goal. And, Actually, we've been interested in this for some time. This is a paper uh, we published in collaboration with Laszlo Barabasi uh, nearly 10 years ago, and we just simply tried to look for interactions between all the diseases, all the genes that were known to uh, be responsible for Mendelian disorders, looking for interactions, for patterns, and so forth. Makes a nice diagram, but didn't really get us too far along. Uh, and we wanted to know, are there unappreciated principles of disease, and if so, what are they, and what do they mean for how we think about disease? At the time we did this study, we had 1,700 disease genes, so now we're, you know, uh, a little over two times that number, and uh, uh, I think studies such as this will be redone over and over again until we begin to really get uh, a sense of how it all works. Um, 
here's an example of the kinds of questions you would like to answer. So uh, just about networks, we talked about biological systems and networks as buffering disease. You could ask, are all networks equally vulnerable to mutation? And if not, what are the rules? We don't really have any rules for this question as far as I know. Um, or we could ask, are all components of a system equally vulnerable? Or if not, what are the rules that make some components more vulnerable than others? Can we predict the consequences of variation in one component uh, on the behavior of the biological system? In other words, if there are 30 uh, proteins in a biological system, what happens if this particular one is reduced in function by 50%? Does the system still work pretty well, or is it completely crippled by that change? So here's two systems. One is the RASMAP kinase pathway. Here's the peroxisome biogenesis pathway. Each of these systems uh, involves about 30 genes, so they're roughly, in terms of that parameter, the same size. Uh, this pathway has more than 15 discrete phenotypes. This pathway really has one to two phenotypes. Uh, no gene predominates in this pathway. In other words, every gene in the pathway has been pegged with mutations causing particular Mendelian phenotypes. In this pathway, actually about 65% 60 per, of the patients with defects in this pathway have it in one gene, a gene called PEX1. So uh, those are two biological systems of roughly the same genetic size, but yet they are quite different in terms of the mutation, the size of the mutational target or the, the, the target that uh, yields a phenotype and the kinds of phenotypes that they produce. And we don't really know enough about it now to look at any given biological system and be able to make meaningful predictions of that type. We should be able to, and we will be able to, I would predict, as we go forward with this project. So uh, I have no idea where I am here, time-wise. So we're done. Close. So let me, I, there's just some quick samples here. So. I want to just say one word about this. Uh, the, I hope you get the sense of the incredible power of Mendelian disease as predicting biological things that we just didn't notice. So this is a disorder, spondylometaphyseal dysplasia, and the patients have two features. They have a cone rod dystrophy, that is a severe visual impairment, and they're short statured with a skeletal dysplasia it looks sort of like achondroplasia. Now, I'm sure all of you sitting in the audience immediately say, well, it's obvious what would cause that phenotype, right? connect those two different biological systems. I mean, when I looked at this, I said, I don't, you know, I don't have a clue what, we're, what could possibly, what gene would possibly bring these two systems together. It's a rare autosomal recessive trait. There's the macular degeneration. The, the gene turns out to be a gene called PCYT1A. Never heard about it until we did the study. Uh, but it encodes an enzyme called phosphocholine cytodilyl transferase, which is the enzyme that's the rate-limiting step and the, bio, and the major pathway for phosphatidylcholine uh, biosynthesis. That's a major component of plasma membranes, some cells that makes up about 50 to 60 percent of the plasma mem of the lipid, structural lipid in the plasma membrane. So it's clearly an important molecule. So I still don't know the answer to why those two systems are affected, but I do know that there are cells in both those systems that have a tremendous demand on membrane biogenesis. The photoreceptors in the retina make a lot of membrane every day, and actually the osteoblasts uh, make a lot of membrane. They enlarge from their sort of resting size by about 30x. That means they need a 10x increment in membrane. And so both of those cell types have a huge uh, uh, demand on membrane biogenesis. So maybe that's why uh, they're the ones that uh, uh, show the phenotype. There's an alternative pathway, but apparently that alternative pathway is not adequate, at least for these two cell types with a big demand. So those are things that we didn't think about until this sort of predictive thing came along. Here's another disorder. This is in press right now, TILO2. It's work done by a student in my lab, Jing Yu, and it, it tags a, a complex called the TTT complex. Never heard of it before but it's involved in interacting with HSP90 and the R2TP complex and does maturation of six enzymes that are very important in the central metabolism of all cells. In fact, uh, those so-called PIC genes have already been tagged with um, Mendelian disorder. So again, we're getting more information about a central biological pathway that's uh, going to be really important in terms of understanding brain function and other functions. <clears throat> 
the Baylor group, the Baylor part of Baylor Hopkins just published this paper. They looked at 128 uh, consanguineous families and found roughly, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's about 48 known disease genes in some of these, in su the subset of these families and another 40 or so high level candidates in the others. They put this all together and they asked when are these genes expressed? Some are expressed in early embryonic life, some are expressed in fetal life um, and so forth. So uh, you're sort of, again, beginning to put these biological systems together and these biological systems are very important for the normal morphology and functioning of the brain. So we're beginning to move from an individual tree in the forest to stand back and beginning to understand the size and the shape and the behavior of the forest itself, at least in this case in the, in the um, development of the brain. The last example also from uh, Jim is uh, looking at uh, peripheral neuropathies, uh, um, Charcot-Marie tooth neuropathies that are now, we now know about 65 genes, tremendous locus heterogeneity, and uh, that monogenic disorders in each of those 65 genes can cause a Charcot-Marie tooth-like phenotype. It turns out, uh, however, that there's a sort of a genetic burden principle. So we think of these as monogenic disorders, but what Jim did is score the genotype of all 65 genes in each of these patients. So it shows this in red is the distribution of loss of function alleles in these patients versus the normal population. I looked at two different populations these data hold up, and what they say is that you have your uh, genotype at the disease gene locus, but that is also affected, and that causes the Mendelian disease, but it's also affected by the genotype at all these other 65 genes, uh, and if you have additional variants at some of the other genes that will make this phenotype more severe or less severe. Uh, so you get the sense of genetic burden, the architecture of genetic disease from these focused uh, studies. So I'll finish with unexpected and emerging ideas coming out of these, this project so far. The first is it shouldn't have been unexpected, but the extent and distribution of genetic variation is just really enormous. We still haven't enumerated all of it. Uh, we're finding tremendous locus heterogeneity. We all knew about locus heterogeneity for certain phenotypes, RP and hearing loss, stuff like that, but we're finding it everywhere we look. Uh, there are many examples of phenotypic expansion, that is, we're fleshing out or expanding our understanding of the phenotype for particular disorders, and this turns out to be very powerful. We always, medicine over and over again forgets that you describe something in three patients and then we start thinking that the phenotype, the aggregate phenotype of those three patients is that disease. And if we, if we describe it in another 100 patients, we'll find out that it's actually quite th different from the phenotype of just three. We're finding an unexpectedly large role for copy number variants and de novo mutations in a lot of Mendelian disease. Relatively high frequency of two diseases occurring in the same difficult to diagnose individual. And uh, we're learning, as I showed you on the last slide, a lot about the genetic architecture and genetic burden for disease. If you want to read about it, this, the project was uh, described in uh, sort of the first three and a half years in this paper, published in uh, late 2015. And uh, thanks for your attention. This is the Baylor Hopkins team. And I'm glad to answer questions. We're at the end of the time. So if you want to just, you can come up and see me. I'm glad to talk.